How Modern Slavery is Putting Your Business at Risk. I'm speaking today with Ingrid Vesgurden. She is head of data strategy with Dow Jones. Hello, Ingrid. How are you today? Uh, hello, uh, Robert. I'm fine. How are you? Great. Thank you very much for taking the time with me to talk about the uh, details of this latest research uh, from Dow Jones Traffic Analysis and Unseen UK. What does this latest research tell us about the presence of human slavery in global supply chains? It tells us a lot of things. Uh, I think one of the things that we wanted to do with the research is really looking at how COVID and the pandemic had impacted the coverage of modern slavery within traditional media. Uh, so that is what we set out to do. So we compare two periods, one pre-pandemic and one during pandemic of six months uh, and looked at that. And one of the most shocking things that we saw, not surprisingly, I think, was that there was a 2000% increase increase in coverage of supply chain disruption. So that is huge. It doesn't surprise you if you think back last year, what companies were doing, they had to adjust, their supply chains were disrupted. They had to adjust, making sure that they could still deliver the goods that they needed to deliver. But as a result of that, the media focus moved away from modern slavery. So we saw a drop in media coverage around 25% across the globe. Uh, so modern slavery wasn't talked about as much. We also saw a huge drop in reported cases. So suddenly cases were no longer being reported and that drop was around 79%. So it isn't necessarily that it went away. It was just not an area of focus. And with that, what we are worried about is that that actually then means that the focus went the way people weren't paying attention as much and now it's hidden in plain sight. So you're implying then that the media can't do two things at once. If they're covering the COVID disruptions, that's going to push push this other stuff, push slavery uh, uh, in instances off the out of the headlines, correct? I would hope that media can do both, right? So focus you, you on think more so. than one thing. But apparently that's not the case here because you're saying that in, indeed what has happened is that be, you're, you're drawing a direct line between the increase in reporting about global supply chain disruptions and the decrease in reporting about modern slavery. Yeah, and that is absolutely what the research saw, but we also saw uh, bright spots. So there were certain jurisdictions where we saw a slight increase and specifically where in those jurisdictions where there's legislation in place, um, it continued to be a topic that was talked about. So if you think about countries like the UK, if you think about Australia, for example, where there is legislation in place that is linked to modern slavery, um, you actually saw that the topic continued to be talked about. The other thing that I think is worth highlighting, uh, when you move away from traditional media, we also looked at social uh, and see if conversations there continue to uh, occur. And while the drop in media was bigger, the drop in social wasn't as big. There was a small decrease, but not as much, which meant that the people continued talking about it, even though the media wasn't always doing that. Wasn't it increasingly difficult, though, to learn just what was going on? On in terms of modern slavery, because so many factories were not accessible during the lockdown, that you couldn't have actual people from NGOs visiting factories and farms and the like. So how do we know exactly what's going on out there during the pandemic when that was the situation? And that's a very good point. And that goes back to the fact that we saw a drop of 79% in reported cases, right? And that if you hear that number, it almost feels like, oh, it went away. It absolutely didn't go away. Because one of the things that we also saw is that the people who are running these criminal businesses are extremely innovative. So initially, it took them a, a, a bit of time to adjust to the new environment, but they were very quick in actually doing that. Uh, so they began they continued to doing their job as in running the criminal networks. Uh, but because of the NGOs not having access to people, it became more difficult to report cases. So that's why you see that stark drop in reported cases. It's interesting that you describe modern slavery as being part of a, a quote unquote criminal network as opposed to incidences within factories, within farms. You actually see a link among numerous instances of modern slave, modern slavery around the world as part of a criminal network as opposed to these isolated incidents? 
Absolutely. And one of the things, if you think about modern slavery, it's an industry, uh, just as any other industry. It's an industry that moves $150 billion around uh, every year. So it's huge. Um, and there might be insulated cases, but there's definitely um, more organized cases. And one of the things that we found was that during the pandemic, labor exploitation actually overtook sexual exploitation, right? That that is where the opportunity was. That is where people were most needed. So that is where the industry focused on. You say overtook, overtook in terms of actual incidents or reporting of those incidents? The number of reported cases. Because mm -hmm. we don't, I mean, behind the scenes as to, as to, with regard to what's actually happening in both labor exploitation and sexual exploitation, those numbers, I are you saying that they pretty much remain steady or they actually are going up? as we're turning our attention away from them? Um, if you think about the number of people that are involved in modern slavery, that hovers around 40, 41 million people. And that number has been stable for the last few years. But what you see happening is there's a large group of people that moves out of the industry every year, but then that same number of people moves into the industry. Yeah. It's, it's shocking, though, for you to say that it's stable, because I would have thought, as you yourself pointed out, we have seen countries stepping forward with legislation led by the UK, I, I guess, uh, more attention being paid to this. Companies themselves in their, uh, in their own personal statements of corporate social responsibility vowing to eliminate slavery from their supply chains. And yet, as you say, the numbers remain steady. What, what's wrong? Why, why isn't it getting better in the face of what appears to be at least growing awareness on the part of the private and public sector of this scourge? Yeah, I think there's a couple of reasons for that. So the public awareness is definitely increasing, uh, but there's always more that you can do. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, in those countries where there is regulation in place, so the UK being a good example, that public awareness continues to increase. But in many other jurisdictions and many other countries, the public awareness isn't there, and people are just not aware of the fact what are type of what are the what are the things that I need to look for, right? So if you think about that, um, there's still a lot of work to do. Um, the, there's, um, not all the regulation is as uh, forceful, uh, but it's not just regulation. It really all starts, and we've, I've mentioned this before with awareness, people really need to understand what is it that I'm looking for. So one of the things that we saw in the research is that financial services uh, the coverage of financial services being linked to modern slavery increased by a lot. Um, and part of the reason for that is because ultimately uh, the people who are involved in modern uh, modern slavery, the people who make money out of that, they need to they need to move the money, they need to launder it, they need to make sure that they have access to it. Mm -hmm. So they use the financial services industry for that. And in order for financial um, financial institutions to really understand how they can identify what a red flag is, they need to understand what it is, what is it that I need to look for. So there's a lot of education that needs to happen. And then on, and the same goes for corporates and the same goes for understanding your supply chain. And then the other part is to have as much collaboration as possible, right? Because someone alone is not going to solve the issue. Corporations alone are not going to solve it. Because you, in order to understand your supply chain, you need so much data. So can you work with governments? Can you work with law enforcement? Can you work with... NGOs and merge all of the data together because that's mm -hmm. then ultimately, once you understand what the red flags are and you have access to the data, that's when you can make a start of eradicating it. Well, let me ask you more, Ingrid, about the red flags and just how you identify human uh, slavery in supply chains today. I wonder, is there sometimes a blurred line between violations of human rights in a factory. In other words, excessive hours, low pay, no breaks, no safety uh, uh, types of things between that type of treatment of workers and actual slavery. How do we tell the difference? And is it important to make that distinction? 
It's very important to make that distinction, right? And from a social perspective, both things are bad. So I'm not, not saying one is worse than the other. The big difference with modern slavery is that the person has no other option, right? So the person has no way out. They are being forced into a situation and they are either through violence, through coercion, through any other means, they they can't escape. Um, and that is, I think, the big difference between the two. Um, and it's hard to, to identify that. And I'm not the expert uh, on, on how to do that, uh, but it's not an easy job. All right. So just quickly, give me some advice on what companies can do to vet their business partners to get a better understanding of their supply chain, understand where this is happening as a step toward eliminating it. Um, yeah, and where it is happening is a very good question, right? Because I think sometimes people believe that it's not happening in their own country. It's somewhere happening far away where I've outsourced my production. That is not the case. So if companies want to do more, it is not only looking at their supply chain or who it takes care of the production, but it's actually also looking at all of your own suppliers. So who cleans the window? Uh, might there be uh, a form of slavery there? Uh, um, and we've seen examples where that definitely has been the case. Um, and then when it comes to the um, when it comes to better understanding the supply chain, it really is uh, asking as many questions as possible and trying to do as much due diligence as you can in understanding what is really happening. So much more to be said on this topic, and I really would love to continue our conversation in future. But in the meantime, for now, Ingrid Verskuren of Dow Jones, thank you so much for opening our eyes to this scourge, to this problem that needs to be eliminated in global supply chains. Thank you very much for being with me today. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure.